It's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to begin reading verse 17. Talking about moving forward in faith. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether it be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first striped grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rahab, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ammon. Shishai and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates into the figs. The place was called the brook Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I pray you give the stillness and the attentiveness of every heart this time. Lord, that you would apply this word to our lives this very day. That you may receive all glory, honor, and praise. It's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Have you ever had a problem and you look at the problem and you end up making the problem bigger than what it needs to be? Come on now. Let's be honest. Have you ever faced opposition and made the opposition out to be more powerful than what it really was? These are questions we're going to be looking at today. So be ready. The passage of Scripture that we just read reveals the curiosity of the nation of Israel. They wanted to know about the land they were sent by God to conquer and inhabit. They wanted to know about that land. It had been 400 years since the Jews had lived in Canaan, dating clear back to the time of Jacob. And so they wanted to know uh, what was going on with that land. They wanted to know where they should go up into that land to conquer it. They wanted to know various aspects of the people who lived there, what their cities looked like. They wanted to know what that was all about. But God had already told them what the land was like. He'd already told them. In Exodus 3, 8, at the burning bush, when God called Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, God told Moses, I am come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them out of that land unto a good land, a large land, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. In other words, God had told Moses previously that that land was an abundantly producing land. 
large and spacious, a land that was good. God told the people about those who lived there. There were the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which would all be classified under Canaanite. So God kept his promises to the nation of Israel. He freed Israel from Egyptian bondage. And in Exodus 13, 5, when God kept his promises, after he had freed the Jews, Moses reminded the people that God has sworn to give the land of Canaan to the Jew. He reminded them that it was a land flowing with milk and honey that it was a land that produced abundantly. And in the interim period of time between the day that Moses met with God and then the Egyptians, I'm sorry, the Israelis were freed from Egyptian bondage, many things had happened that proved that God is God that proved that God is faithful to keep his promises. Because the Jewish people had seen miraculous works of God in the land of Egypt. They'd seen God devastate Egypt with ten plagues. They'd seen the protective hand of God watch over them on that Passover day when they applied the blood to the doorposts and the lintel, and their firstborn were spared from death. They'd seen how God led them by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire to show that he was with them, that his presence went before them. They had seen God part the Red Sea to allow them to cross over, they saw that same Red Sea that parted and allowed them to cross over and close the Egyptians and drown the Egyptian army. They knew that God had made a distinction between them and the Egyptians. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 20 through 23, Moses writes, You were come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. Neither be discouraged. It's like Moses knew what was coming. And at that time you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and to what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one from each tribe. So God had led the Jewish people to the border of the land of Canaan, from there, Moses sent out 12 men to spy out the land and report back as to what they saw. And out of 12 of those men that were sent, only two gave a good report of the land. Only two tried to convince the people to move forward. The others wanted to return to Egypt. Our subject today has to do with moving forward in faith. It has to do with avoiding stagnation. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines stagnation as a condition that is marked by a lack of flow, a lack of movement, or a lack of development. People stagnate when they're not moving forward in their faith. Amen? Amen? 
when they're not developing their relationship with God, stagnation happens. They get stuck in a rut. Have you ever known anyone be stuck in a rut? You know, unfortunately, there are people that get stuck in a rut and they stay in that rut for many years. Lack of forward progress. And being stuck in a rut is often the result of a lack of concern. No concern for moving forward. No concern for moving forward in the faith. Before we go any further, I want to go back to some of those questions that I asked at the beginning and ask that you consider these again. Have you ever been guilty of exaggerating the power of the opposition? Have you ever been guilty of making the opposition look as though they were invincible? Have you ever been guilty of underestimating the power of God? Even when God makes his will plainly evident. Have you ever allowed fear to control your life? Even when God reveals his will to you, have you ever allowed fear to control your life? Moses sent 12 men to check out the land. Ten of those men only saw the opposition. In fact, we're going to see that they magnified the opposition. They exaggerated the opposition. They made the opposition look as though they were invincible. So they took the attitude, why bother? It's impossible, so why should I be concerned about it? Two men, they saw past the opposition. Instead of magnifying, exaggerating the power of the opposition, they saw opportunity. Opportunity to move forward. That makes all the difference in the world. So do you look at the opposition or do you look at God? We walk by faith, not by sight. To walk by faith is to keep our eyes focused on God and what is eternal, is to keep our eyes focused on what God has said, what God has promised, is to keep our eyes focused on what God has done. To walk by sight you know, a lot of times with our eyes, we see the opposition as a big, bad monster. Amen? We see what opposes us as being invincible. But we're to walk by faith, not by sight. I'm going to read you the report of those who were sent to spy out the land of Canaan. This is found in Numbers chapter 13, verse 26 through 29. After they showed them the fruit of the land, they said, We came into the land where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey. We could be glad that at least on that part they agreed with God. This is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell on the land. The cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, they dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of the Jordan. They only saw the opposition. But now I want to notice the words of Caleb 
as compared to all the rest. Verse 30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and so they said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. What a difference. But the men that went with him said, we're not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. And they brought an evil report of the land which they had searched out unto the children of Israel, saying, the land which we have gone to search is the land that eats up its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so were we in their sight. Caleb saw opportunity. The others only saw opposition. They exaggerated the opposition. They magnified the power of the enemy. And they discouraged the people by magnifying the power of the enemy, as people often do. Six objections they had. The land eats up its inhabitants. The people were very strong. The cities that the people dwell in had walls to protect them from invasion. The cities had many people. They were the descendants of the giants, and they were so big that we looked like grasshoppers. From Caleb's perspective, though, he looked through the eyes of faith. From Caleb's perspective, the battle belonged to the Lord. He tried to convince the people, but to no avail. Caleb did not exaggerate the power of the opposition, and neither did he underestimate the power of God. In Genesis 15, verse 7 through 18, God had promised Abraham and his descendants the land of Canaan. He guaranteed that promise by an unconditional covenant. In Genesis 15, 13, God told Abraham that the Jews would be in bondage to a foreign people for 400 years. That's exactly what happened. Go figure. The Jews had been in bondage to Egypt for 400 years. God had freed them from bondage to Egypt. Genesis 15, 14, God told Abraham that he'd punish that nation that had held them captive. And he would deliver them from bondage. These things happened. God fulfilled his promises. But 10 of the 12 men didn't believe the promises of God. They had seen these things happen. Instead, the ten who were unbelieving had what I like to refer to as stinking thinking. Instead of seeing the blessings of God in this opportunity that lie before the Jewish people, they were guilty of stinking thinking. They had the idea that God had set them up for defeat. set them up for destruction at the hands of their enemies. But Joshua and Caleb, they stood firm in their convictions. Only two men stood firm in their conviction that God would prevail over the Canaanites. 
And I want to tell you that when the people of Israel heard the report of these ten who gave the bad report, it was like a contagion. It spread like wildfire. Numbers 14, verse 1 through 4, all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. The people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would to God we had died in the wilderness. Wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should be a prey? Would it not have been better for us to return to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us make a captain. Let us return to Egypt. They were ready to ditch Moses and Aaron and return to Egypt. Notice the response to the report of the twelve. They wept. They complained against Moses and Aaron. They blamed God. They looked for the easy way out. Why don't we just return to Egypt? And one thing they didn't do, they didn't look inside themselves. They didn't look in the mirror to find out what the real problem was. That was their response. After all God had done for them, all that God had revealed to them, after seeing the power of God on their behalf, they were faithless. Remember, God had sent ten devastating plagues upon the land of Egypt that destroyed the economy of Egypt. Exodus 10, 7. He had delivered the Jews from bondage to Egypt by the blood of the Passover lamb. Exodus 12, verse 33 through 38. He had parted the Red Sea so they could escape the Egyptians. Exodus 14, verse 21 and 22. He had made a distinction between the Egyptians and the Jews when he drowned the Jews in the same sea that he parted for them. Exodus 14, verse 23 through 28. They had seen that God provided manna in the wilderness. The word manna means what is it? They didn't even know what to call it. But he provided a miraculous provision of food in the desert, Exodus 15, 16, 15. He led them by a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud as a visible sign of his presence, Exodus 13, verse 21. He gave them his law. Exodus 20, verse 1 through 17, and he led them to the border of the land of Canaan. He took them to the exact place he wanted them to cross over into Canaan. But after all that they had seen, that God had done for him, they did not trust him to take them into the land of Canaan. But hear the words now of Caleb and Joshua. This is in Numbers 14, verse 5 through 9. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them to search the land, they tore their clothes. They spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land 
which we pass through to search is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord. Neither fear the people of the land. Notice what he says. For they are our bread. Their defense is parted from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Joshua and Caleb knew and they believed what God had promised. They knew that God was with them. The others did not believe, even with all of the evidence. God had established milestones in the lives of the Jewish people. Milestones that they could see and remember. But when we forget what God has done for us in the past, how much easier it is to overlook and forget what God will do for us now. When we forget what God has done to guide us and to provide for us in the past, it's not difficult to forget his, his ability to guide us and provide for us now. And such unbelief carries heavy consequences. From Numbers chapter 14, verse 36 through 38, we see that the ten spies who gave the bad report, they died from a plague sent by God. Only Joshua and Caleb remind, remained out of the twelve who were sent out to spy out the land of Canaan. And out of 603,550 men who were over age 20, get that again, 603,550 men who were over the age of 20, only two remained after 40 years. Only two remained to enter the promised land. They were Caleb and Joshua. From Numbers 14, verse 29 and 30, God said, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swore to make you dwell therein, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. That generation was doomed to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. One year for every day that Canaan was searched out. Joshua and Caleb entered in. And years later, Caleb was still moving forward in faith. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, after fighting a war to conquer the land of Canaan for five years, Caleb was still moving forward in faith. From Joshua 14, verse 6 through 12, we see Caleb came to Joshua. He requested that Joshua allow him to go up and fight for the land that God had promised to him personally. That would be the land of Hebron. Caleb was now 85 years old. 45 years had passed. 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Five years fighting the war to conquer Canaan 
45 years had passed, and notice that Caleb didn't meet with Joshua to talk about the good old days. Caleb didn't meet with Joshua to talk about the good old days. Caleb wanted to talk to Joshua about the future. At 85 years of age, he was looking forward to the future. He didn't use his gray hair as an excuse. He was still looking forward to forward progress. He was not stagnating. He was not stuck in a rut. He was not sitting idle on the sidelines. He was moving forward in faith. Caleb had done what God had commanded. He had entered Canaan under the leadership of Joshua. That new generation that entered with him conquered the land by the power of the Lord just as God had promised. While others died in the wilderness, Caleb kept moving forward. This is what God had to say about Caleb. Numbers 14, verse 24. But my servant Caleb because he had another spirit with him and it followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed, his children, shall possess it. Another spirit. The spirit of God caused Caleb to rise above fear. I'll say that again. The spirit of God caused Caleb to rise above earthly fear. Caleb had fear, but not that kind. He had the fear of the Lord. God rewarded his faithfulness. But regarding those who refused God, surely none of the men that came out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. Because they have not wholly followed me, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. So when Caleb was 85 years old, he met with Joshua to speak to him about what God had promised him. He met with Joshua to speak to him about what the future holds. God had promised him the land he had trodden upon. That land was known as Hebron. From Joshua 14, verse 7 through 9, 40 years old. This is part of the conversation between Joshua and Caleb. 40 years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of this people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore to me on that day, saying, Surely the land whereupon thy feet have trodden shall be thy inheritance, and thy children's inheritance forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. From Joshua 14, verse 14, we see then that Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb because he wholly followed the Lord his God. Folks, faith requires that we take a risk. Faith requires that we take a risk, but we have to understand that the risk is in trusting God. 
I want to say there's not a lot of risk involved in that. Caleb and Joshua took the risk of trusting God because they knew that God was faithful to keep his promises. They saw the works of God. They knew the promises of God. They saw God fulfill those promises one after another. They knew that God had promised the land of Canaan unto the children of Abraham. Faith in God is not blind faith. It's not blind faith. God gives his people faith. When Abel offered a blood sacrifice, it was not done in blind faith. According to Genesis 3.21, Abel must have known that without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sin. Abel offered a blood sacrifice, whereas his brother Cain did not. By faith, Abel didn't follow the ways of his brother. When God called Noah to build an ark, Noah didn't even respond in blind faith. From Scripture, we learn in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. From Genesis 6, 3, we learn that he was a preacher of righteousness for 120 years. He called people to repent or face the wrath of God. We also see this about Noah in Genesis 6, verse 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That means Noah was saved by grace through faith. God had revealed himself to Noah. Noah took the risk of being called a moron. Think about it this way. It had never rained. And here's this guy in the desert building an ark. Noah took the risk of being called names. But Noah had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah knew the Lord. Noah trusted the Lord. Noah built the ark. When God called Moses, Moses did not respond in blind faith. In Exodus 3, verse 1 through 6, Moses had an encounter with the angel of the Lord. That angel of the Lord identified himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Further, I, he identified himself in Exodus 3.14 as Yahweh, the great I Am. So when Moses received the call from God... It wasn't on blind faith. Moses had an encounter with God. Just to make the matter a little deeper, Moses even needed his faith to be strengthened. You ever been called by God to do something you didn't think you could do, then argue with God until you're blue in the face trying to tell him you can't do it? That's what Moses did. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 through 9, Moses needed to have his strength, his faith strengthened, so God strengthened Moses' faith. He says, see that rod in your hand? Throw it down on the ground and it'll turn to a serpent. And it did. He said, grab that serpent by the tail and it'll turn back to a stick. And it did. Moses was told by God, if they don't believe that sign, maybe they'll believe the next one. Stick your hand into your robe. Moses did, and it turned to leprosy. God said, take your hand out, and it turned back to normal. God strengthened Moses' faith by telling Moses that he had the power to turn the water to blood. 
and he did. When God called Moses, he didn't respond in blind faith. I don't know if you've ever thought much about Joshua, but when Joshua was called to replace jo uh, Moses, I'm thinking he thought, wow, what a task. But Joshua also did not respond in blind faith. We have to remember that Joshua had seen the mighty works of God. The mighty works that God had done through Moses. And not only that, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 through 7, God promised Joshua that he would lead the children of Israel into Canaan. So Moses took the unenviable position of, I'm sorry, Joshua took the unenviable position of Moses. Can you imagine trying to fill those shoes? Through faith, Joshua led the children of Israel into Canaan. When God chose a man named Gideon to go to battle against the Midianites, he did not respond in blind faith. Gideon actually asked God to verify that it was God's will for him to deliver Israel from Midian. So God gave Gideon the sign of the fleece. You can read about that in Judges 6, verse 36 through 40. By the way, that wasn't enough. God must have known, God did know, that Gideon needed even more assurance. So God gave Gideon even more assurance. He caused Gideon to overhear a conversation going on in the Midianite camp that made mention of Gideon overthrowing the Midianites. Imagine that, that God would do something like that. Through faith, Gideon prevailed over the Midianites. God gave him the faith to do that. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow and worship the golden image set up by King Nebuchadnezzar, they didn't respond in blind faith either. From Daniel 3, verse 16 through 18, this is their reply. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. They were under the threat of death for refusing the king. They knew God could save them if that was their will. They were ready to die if it was not the will of God to save them. God had given them the faith they needed to trust in him. Esther was queen of Persia. When she was presented with a challenge that could have cost her her life, she didn't respond in blind faith either. When she was asked to appear before the king unannounced, on behalf of the Jewish people, when Haman, the Agagite, sought to destroy the Jews, she knew it was against the law to appear before the king without prior approval. 
She knew she could die for doing so. And what did she do? She prayed for God's favor. She knew that God was able to deliver her. She not only prayed for God's favor, she petitioned others to pray for her, that she would receive God's favor. And she did receive God's favor. Queen Esther went before the Jew king on behalf of the Jews, and the Jewish people were saved from destruction. Faith demands taking a risk. But taking a risk is something that many people are not willing to do because of fear. Caleb and Joshua, well, they took a risk in believing God. When others would not, they did. From Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we read, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That faith is the substance of things hoped for means the faith stands under what is hoped for. It means the faith is the basis of real hope. When it says the faith is the evidence of things not seen, it means it's the evidence of those things that are true but not yet seen. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. So faith stands under what is hoped for. Faith is the conviction of what is true but not yet seen. God gives his people faith. Sight refers to those things which may or not be, may or may not be what they appear to be. Oftentimes our eyesight focuses on the opposition, magnifies the opposition, diminishes the power of God. Faith focuses upon God. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God rewards those who diligently seek him. Caleb and Joshua look forward in faith. They saw opportunity, whereas the others saw nothing but opposition. They believed the promises of God. They had courage that came through faith. They had courage in the face of opposition. They moved forward. In these last days, how many know that we're living in the last days? I just preached on that last week, I believe. In these last days, is it not important with society falling apart? Is it not important that we see life through the eyes of faith? Is it not important that we see eyes, life through the eyes of faith rather than by what we see all the time and hear all the time? Is it not important as we contend all the time against unending peer pressure? Is 
that we see life through the eyes of faith. With so much work to be done and with so little time to do it, is it not important also that we see life through the eyes of faith? It is. Let us pray. Father in heaven, during this time, I do pray that you would consecrate this word to every heart, that we would understand what faith really is. Faith is what you give to your people. You have proven yourself. You have shown yourself to be faithful. You have provided every need and much more. Help us to consecrate ourselves to you, to do the work you've called us to do. Help us not to magnify the power of the enemy and help us not to diminish your power to overcome. We pray, God, that you consecrate us to your work, to your will, for your purpose, that you receive all glory, honor, and praise. In Christ's name, amen.